So I, I think it's a really important point that Mitch Little was raising, this question of can you obstruct a federal investigation? Can you obstruct a federal investigation? Under my legal knowledge, I've been doing this 20, almost 24 years, of course you can obstruct a federal investigation. There's actually a, st a federal statute, obstruction of justice of charges, where it states when someone acts in a way to intentionally impede or interfere with the government investigation or prosecution, federal obstruction of justice charges are designed to protect the integrity of the criminal justice process. So I don't know what the lawyers are so talking about Fifth Circuit case law. I don't know that case law, uh, as Mr. Penley did not know that case law, but I find it hard to believe that you cannot obstruct a federal investigation. Uh, I would actually find that very hard to believe. He, qual he qualified what it was, right? That precedent that he cites is obviously a very obscure reference. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, Mr. Penley hadn't heard that during his 16 years that he uh, was there. And he also qualifies the, the rule. And he says, you cannot obstruct justice because it's not a a proper file. What was the term they used? It's not an a investigation. Not a, yet. It's, it's not a. It's not a procedure. Therefore, you can't obstruct something that's not a procedure. So it's semantics that he's using, but he's trying to confuse the jury to say you, you, it's not possible that you can do that. He's also going down the line of uh, reasoning from what we're seeing right up front that you know even if all of this stuff occurred just as you said. There's no, nothing illegal has occurred here. Well, I don't think that's the argument being made. The argument being made isn't that the investigation was somehow illegal or improper. The argument being made is that the Attorney General of the state of Texas was undertaking this investigation for purposes that might have benefited himself or to cover up other information that was already out there. For personal gain. All these investigations where something's going on between uh, A.G. Paxton and uh, his friend, client. I don't know what Mr. Paul is to him <laughs> in relation, but the fact that Mr. Paul is dictating a lot of what is going on and Paxton is basically giving him carte blanche to do whatever he wants in regards to subpoenas on civil matters. I mean, that's that's as I forgot the word that. Mark Penley used, but that's that's ludicrous if you think about it. <laughs> well, it, it's stunning that you, you have a situation, and I it's hard for me to, I still, even now, to wrap my mind around the fact that Nate Paul's attorney is going with Brandon Kamick to deliver these subpoenas. And they actually recorded this. I've listened to the recordings uh, of Nate Paul's attorney. He introduces himself and, and I, I remember I listened to one of them, to the bank president, it's very clear who he is. How do you justify having Nate Paul's attorney along with Brandon Kamick delivering subpoenas? It's even worse than what you described, right? Because he was not only delivering this, this subpoena, he was doing it under the auspices that he was the government agent of the state of Texas. So his, his, his signature was that I'm a special prosecutor in this instance, and that was the justification for Kamek uh, being able to get that information. And then the second issue was that they were saying it, they were using criminal uh, investigatory power for a civil matter on a second matter that was unrelated to the first. I mean, a absolutely, uh, uh, un uh, this is the kind of thing that you would not expect um, from the AG's office. And again, whether or not it's illegal, it's highly inappropriate. and. But certainly, I think um, it points to some level of culpability from uh, whoever was instigating this in the beginning. Think of this, Tanya. He's using the attorney general, Nate Paul's using the attorney general's office powers, uh, misleading, saying first that he's a special prosecutor, which he wasn't, to investigate Nate Paul's enemies in a civil matter. That's what Paxton is allowed to, uh, allowed to be going on, which is awful. Yeah. If it's not illegal, I don't know what it is, but it, it's not right. And I imagine uh, the people who listen to that testimony have to be disgusted with it. Well, and they, and they listed off the people, uh, uh, Penley listed off the people that they wanted investigated and included a clerk <laughs> at the magistrate's office. I mean, it's like a bad movie. You just can't believe, like, because that, that was a new one. I didn't realize that among the people they wanted investigated was a clerk. I mean, think of like the, just the stunning level of where we're at, you know, just it's, 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 
it's it, it would almost be a comedy, but it's not very funny because you're talking about the top law enforcement officer in the state of Texas that these allegations are being made about. And, and these descriptions from all these former top people in the office describing how the top cop in Texas doesn't trust law enforcement and is actively trying to investigate federal and state officials. It's just, it's just mind boggling. And that's the theme we saw recurring. Whenever A.G. Paxton wanted to justify certain actions he was taking with his staff, he would say, you have no idea what it feels like to be prosecuted by, uh, by federal agents. And therefore he has this animus against the federal authorities uh, that apparently imbues his judgment when he makes these kinds of claims. Again, w whether or not you, you agree with this politics or do not, the mere fact that you have an animus against federal authorities does not give you the, uh, the right or the privilege of taking action against those authorities that is, A, highly inappropriate and in this case, likely illegal. I mean, this is something, again, where if I'm Penley and I'm watching this occur in real time, I'm just shocked at the level of impropriety that he that I would be seeing from from the top cop uh, in in the state of Texas. Jason, did you find it odd when Penley asked the attorney, general, why are you interested in this one? I wrote it down yeah. and he said, not in other cases, but why this one? Yeah. And if you think about it and think about everything that Nate Paul and Paxton have done, Penley asking his boss, why this one? And then right. he says, well, you know, they're too biased towards law enforcement. They are law enforcement. Yeah. They are the top law enforcement in the state of Texas, but we're, they're biased towards law enforcement, the feds and Nate Paul and everyone's in cahoots against him. <laughs> and he says, yeah. he says, I don't know about all of the other cases that you could be referring to. I only know about this one, again, which speaks to his, his state of mind. He knows about this one because there is an interest that he has taken uh, from Mr. Paul, right, during, during this time for the things we've already talked about, right? The covering up of the infidelity and then the alleged uh, payment for remodeling of the kitchen. Yeah, and, and it had to be, I'm just imagining, you know, Penley having this conversation with Ken Paxton and, and probably just trying to wrap his mind around it, you know, trying <laughs> to understand, you know, you are the state's top cop and you are, and, and, and and bear in mind, I am not saying that there cannot be misconduct by law enforcement. Sure. I've spent my career, I mean, I've been a, my, primarily my career has been uncovering uh, police and also prosecutorial misconduct. So it's not like I'm, I sit here as somebody who thinks that, oh, law enforcement always gets it right, there's never any corruption. Absolutely not. I believe it's certainly possible. But to believe it in this case, you know, there's a, there's a saying that, um, uh, somebody said to me back when I was covering the Eric Williams case, where he was the guy that killed uh, the, the Kaufman County DA, mm -hmm. his wife, and the top assistant. Mm -hmm. And when they were, uh, this is after the, 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 pros the first prosecutor's been killed, um, and somebody said to me, Occam's Razor. And Occam Ra Occam's Razor is this concept that says the most logical answer is the answer. And in that particular case, the logical answer was that Eric Williams had done these killings. He's on death row, by the way. And um, because this particular person that was telling me this was mad about a story I had done, I had done this story because there was a lot of theories about whether these um, uh, motorcycle gangs were somehow involved because the, one of the prosecutors had done some prosecutions. But, um, and and I, so I've always carried that with me, this concept of Occam's razor. So to believe Nate Paul's story defies Occam's razor. It doesn't make any sense. You'd have to believe that all these people got to got together to conspire, all these ethical people. I mean, it doesn't, what would they have to gain? Why is Nate Paul uh, someone that pe all these people would want to throw away their careers to conspire? It doesn't make any sense. Well, but, let me throw something else at you, right? Because you're referring to the first referral, right? So we've got the issue where they think that the warrant has been changed. And the second referral, where Kamek's going out there actually calling on banks and getting information, that related to a civil matter that- Right, the Mini Paul, Foundation. Yeah, so, uh, so a, a civil matter that was separated in part from the first referral. So now you've got two instances where Nate Paul has injected himself into the office of the AG 
and he's utilizing the, the power and the heft of the AG's office to conduct not only you know, an investigation of these improper federal authorities, but an investigation of this banking situation where he's talked to two different banks. I mean, it's very hard to make the argument that it was just, uh, you know, Attorney General Paxson fighting for the little guy who's being you know, stepped on by the big boot of the federal government. Because that's the <laughs> argument that's being made. But it's right. clear that it relates to this one individual and it's across criminal and civil matters. Tanya, think of it like this. In trial law, whether when I was a prosecutor or as a defense attorney, you use your terminology. We use this terminology in front of juries. It's common sense. Use your common sense here. After listening to Mr. Penley and the other witnesses, what is reasonable? What is rational? All right. Then you have to think after hearing all this testimony that Nate Paul just has the goods on Attorney General Paxton because what Paxton is doing for Nate Paul is not being done for any other citizen in the state of Texas. Mm. Not right. one. So let's use our reason. Let's use our common sense and let's deduct where this is ending up. And like I said in the beginning, the evidence is 100 percent there. It's a matter of whether those Republican senators will follow the evidence or follow the politics. Right. Well, and, and, and there is no doubt this is a political proceeding. I mean, you cannot get around uh, what this is, and it will take nine Republicans. We saw in the, um, the first day where they voted on the motions, you had six Republicans, six Republican senators who solidly, solidly voted to dismiss the whole thing throughout the, and then you had a couple join in here and there on, on, on some of the other various emotion, uh, uh, motions, but it, you seem to have six solid votes to acquit him. I mean, I, you, you, you can't make any total assumptions, but that seems reasonable. Um, but I have never in my career heard anything quite like this. I mean, this is just, um, it's kind of off the charts. Um, and you just, but you're right, common sense, Occam's razor, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. Um, and, I, and I tend to believe after having listened to all the uh, witness testimony that we wouldn't be here. It, I, I don't think it was the open record situation or the foreclosure situation or the situation with Mitty. Those, that's not what tips it over the edge. It is the grand jury subpoenas because now at that point, you're using, as, as Penley's describing, you're using, the, you're using criminal proceedings for civil discovery and also to investigate federal officials. But so, it's civil discovery against Nate Paul's enemies. Or right. At, and, and so that's even more ridiculous than what Paxton's allowing being done. Yeah, it, it is crazy. And the Mitty Foundation, just to explain what, what the Mitty Foundation was, um, the Mitty Foundation had entered into a, 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 a they'd invested with Nate Paul's uh, companies. And when, when the time uh, uh, had come to pay, um, they, he had not paid them. And so they they'd ended up suing. There was a, a whole bunch of litigation that had gone back and forth. They had agreed, Nate Paul had agreed to pay this amount. And then when that time came to pay that amount that they'd agreed to pay, he didn't pay. And so um, it triggered you know, more proceedings. So this was kind of a long running deal. And the AG's office has a responsibility under um, state law to uh, protect essentially the public's um, rights with nonprofits. And so that's where it came in. And so, um, but to be delivering subpoenas <laughs> with Nate Paul's attorney to banks. And, 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 so the, and so rather than discontinuing Nate, uh, Brandon Kamick's efforts, you, you seem to support it. The Attorney General seemed to have no issue with it. it, just, it, it I, I just don't understand it. I, I, I cannot wrap my mind around it. And the longer, I, the longer I watch the defense and the defense attorneys, I, I, I'm seeing the strategy develop. I mean, right, they're not arguing the case on the law or per the facts. They're arguing for those six senators that they think they can keep, and then if they can pick off three or four more by providing them just enough cover 
that they can go home and explain to those Republican women's clubs why they voted to acquit, then that will be sufficient for them to vote to acquit. All they have to do, unlike in, in a criminal trial where you've got you know, jurors who swear to you know, make sure that they vote in favor of uh, the rule of law and in accordance with the law, these senators have a different standard. Of, of course, they want to be perceived as following the law, but because they wear the political hat and because they're not an ordinary juror, they can, in, they can include other facts in their analysis as to whether or not they vote to acquit. And I think that's the strategy that we're seeing from the, the defense counsel. Again, they're just trying to cast doubt and cast uh, some, some smoke on uh, the, the, the evidence here. It's because it's so clear and overwhelming to people like us as lawyers and as people who are watching this with the understanding of what is true and what is not true, but it's much different to be in the chair that those senators are in, knowing that if they vote the wrong way, whichever way that might be in their district, that that could mean that they're going to be unelected. And that um, is a different kind of analysis than what you have from an ordinary juror. And so, legal, legally speaking, Tanya, and this is what bothers me, I'm, I'm not as political as Jason, obviously, when it comes to either side. But if you put this in front of 12 citizens in any county in Texas, okay. not just Travis County, I'm talking Dallas County, I'm talking Collin County, the evidence is so overwhelming, they will go back in the jury room, write true to all the allegations in the impeachment proceeding. Okay? However, it almost is comparable to what happened on the national stage with Trump and the impeachment. Uh, what's going on here is politics are being weaved in. And as Jason said, they're looking to find enough people to hold the line and can go back home and be reelected. You know, maybe have some people mad at them, but be reelected. It's political survival. Because if you're basing it on the facts that are presented, no rational, I said this before, no reasonable person could say he did not do this. And that's going to be an interesting thing that I'm looking forward to seeing uh, at the end of this is, is will they follow the evidence or will they follow their political survival? You know, my, my sources in Austin tell me that in this case, because there's so much baggage that pa Attorney General Paxton even brings to even this trial, right? He was already under federal indictment for securities law. And, well, that's and state indictment, Jason. A sta sta oh, state, yeah, state, state, in state indictment. But he already had that baggage as he was coming to this trial. And then you get a layer on this. It's almost a bridge too far. And I think people are tired of, of dealing with this ongoing situation. And I think a lot of people who are in those chairs in the Senate are now thinking through the jockeying for who will be the next attorney general, right? And so if you're sitting in that chair, you've got, you've got your designs on on running for AG, even if you're a you know, solid conservative who would normally vote to acquit, <laughs> if you vote to in, impeach and, and he leaves, then you might be running for office, you know? And then if that seat fills up, then there are other seats that can be backfilled and the musical chairs moves around. So there's other calculus going on in addition to merely, uh, you know, right, wrong, or being reelected or not being reelected. I think people are starting to to read the tea leaves as to what this next election will look like and whether or not they might be interested in running for, for AG of Texas. Okay, guys, well, we're going to take a break for lunch. Jason, thank you so, Jason Fialba, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you're, uh, you've got other things to do. And so Bernadine Steptoe, our WFA, one of our political analysts for us, is going to join us in the afternoon. Um, and anyway, thank you so much. And Josh will be back as well. And so we will, we will see y'all after lunch. Great. Thank you.